one thing I want tour groups to know about this laboratory. We've talked maybe a little bit about our permit. We have a permit that tells us everything that we have to measure, everything we have to report. This lab does all of that, and then they do a hell of a lot more. Um, this lab is equipped with apparatus and people to go well beyond our permit. We use this laboratory to make informed operational decisions about what water to use, how much of it to use, and it drives decisions probably on a weekly basis and sometimes even more frequent. So I'm going to turn it over to Katie Frank. Katie, you've got nursing students from Mercy. I don't know if that strikes any nerves with you or not. Your former <laughs> hospital employee, maybe you can share a little bit about your background and how you got into going to Waterworks and sure. do your normal. Sure, yep. So as Mike said, I'm Katie Frank. I'm a microbiologist. So I actually worked at Mercy Hospital in the microbiology lab there for five years before coming here. It was a really great um, educational opportunity just because when you're at the hospital in the micro lab, you see everything. Uh, there's a lot of ill people who are at the hospital, obviously, so you see a lot of interesting organisms. You see all kinds of organisms you didn't think you would ever see because you have immigrants and other people of that nature. So it's a really great place to learn microbiology straight out of college. So coming here, it's kind of nice because I know the bugs, but I don't see them, which is great because we don't want to see them in our finished water, obviously. Um, but I can look for all of those things. So it's a really good background to have coming here. All right, so now I'm going to jump into what I do here now. Uh, so just to kind of get you thinking about microbiology. So everything up on this poster is encompassed in microbiology. So in your body and on your body right now, you've got millions, if not trillions, of bacteria and viruses and other microorganisms. So a lot of those are beneficial. They keep you healthy. There's also some out in the environment, and those keep ecosystems functioning. However, some of those organisms can make you sick, and we call those pathogens, and those are the ones that I'm worried about here at Des Moines Waterworks Laboratory. So here at Des Moines Waterworks, if you look at this map of Iowa, we use the Des Moines River and the Raccoon River as our source waters. If you see, these rivers extend all the way up into Minnesota, so that's a massive watershed. So what that means for us when I'm looking at it microbiologically is there's a lot of entry points for disease-causing organisms, either by soil runoff or soil erosion or precipitation events. And to give you kind of more of a visual of that, this is what our rivers look like when they come to us. So very murky, lots of sediment, lots of small particles, and you can imagine lots of bacteria and other microorganisms. So then here at the plant, we purify the water, we treat it, and when it comes out of your faucets at your businesses and homes, it looks like this. And even though it looks safe and to drink and nice and pure, my job is to make sure that it actually is safe to drink microbiologically. So here at the lab, we do several things in order for me to do that. So we do distribution system studies. Our federal regulatory agency is the Environmental Protection Agency, and they require that we take 151 samples of our distribution every month. So what that means is we have to go out to sites that receive our water after it leaves the plant and make sure that we, don't, we aren't seeing any microbial regrowth out in our distribution. We also do water treatment studies, which I'll talk about more here in a second. And we do some outside customer service. So pool and spas are required to be tested monthly for bacteria, and they'll bring those samples here. We also do well testing for private residents. And we also do um, contractor new mains. So when a new main or a new development is going up, they'll put in new water mains. And we want to make sure that those are microbiologically pure before they're going into use. So we're going to zoom in on the bacteria section of that poster and an even more specific group of coliform bacteria. It would be impossible for me to look for every single bacterium that's out there because there are hundreds of them. So what we do is we use a group of indicator organisms called coliform bacteria to help us determine if our water is safe or unsafe to drink. The reason why we use those coliform bacteria is because they are present in our GI tracts and also in the GI tracts of other mammals. So if I'm seeing those, that suggests to me the water is not safe to drink because there could be other microbial threats, and the opposite is true. So if they are not present, that is, indicates that the water is safe to drink, we're properly treating it, and we're getting rid of all of those microorganisms. So one method that I use to look for those coliform bacteria is called the Pawnee tray method. And what I do for that is I have this little pouch of cold alert media. It was made specifically for the water industry. I pop it open, I pour it into my water sample, and then I pour that mixture into what's called a Pawnee tray. So it opens up like that, I pour in my water sample. I run it through my heat sealer, and on day one it will look like this with all the wells clear. I'll incubate this for 24 hours, and if there's one or more coliform bacteria in any of these wells, it'll turn yellow. So. All of that is coliform bacteria. So then what I do is I count the number of large wells and the number of small wells that are positive and compare that to a chart, and that gives me an estimate of how many coliform bacteria are in my water sample. 
What I also do with this is differentiate E. coli, and the reason why is because E. coli is a really great indicator of a recent fecal contamination. So if I'm seeing a lot of E. coli, that indicates that there could be other microbial threats that we need to be worried about here at the lab. So the way that I differentiate E. coli is by using a UV light. I'll shine it over my quantity tray, and if you can see those wells that are fluorescing, those are E. coli. So then I do the same thing. I'll count the number of large wells and small wells that are positive for E. coli compared to that chart, and then I'll get an estimate of how much E. coli is in my water sample. So what that quantity tray method looks like here at the plant is every day I test our source waters. So this is a quantity tray of our river. As you can imagine, lots of coliform bacteria, lots of E. coli. The water then flows into our pre-sedimentation basin, and that's going to help take out a lot of that sediment and small particles and things of that nature like what we're seeing in that bowl. The water then flows into our lime softening basin, and that basin does a lot for us microbiologically. One, the lime raises the pH, so that has a bacterial cytal effect, which will kill off some bacteria for us. And two, it causes a process called coagulation and flocculation, which makes some um, sediment and other particles kind of stick together, and then they'll settle out on the bottom. So with that, bacteria will go and settle out on the bottom and be removed from the water. So after these two steps, I test our water to make sure that I'm seeing that reduction of coliform bacteria that I should be seeing. So as you can see, when we're going from here to here, we're definitely seeing a reduction of coliform bacteria, and I usually don't see E. coli at this point. The water then flows into our filtration building, and in that building we have 16 sand filter beds. Sand filters provide another physical removal of those bacteria, so we'll test the water again after that step. And as you can see, we have another reduction of coliform bacteria, so I usually hardly see anything at this point, and I definitely usually don't see any E. coli at this point. We then add chlorine and fluoride, and the water can go to our nitrate removal facility if we're seeing high nitrates. If not, we'll bypass that facility, and our water will go into what's called the clear well. It will sit there for several hours to make sure that we're um, letting the chlorine react with the water long enough to kill off any residual organisms. And then we'll test our finished water every day. And it should always look like this, with no coliform bacteria, nothing that will make us sick. Hmm. So I also previously mentioned that we have to do those 151 distribution samples every month per the EPA requirement. Uh, the suburbs also test their distributions, so Ankeny, Altoona, Clive, those areas will also get distribution samples. They actually bring them here, here and we'll test those. So all in all, I'm doing about 400 to 450 distribution samples. If I tried to do quantity trays on all of those, it would be very time consuming and very costly, especially since I'm not expecting to see any coliform bacteria out in the distribution since the water is nice and safe when it's leaving our plant. So I use another method called membrane filtration for those samples. And what that looks like is I take a filter and place it on this vacuum apparatus. What's the pore size on that? I'll get to okay, that. Um, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> I turn on my vacuum or in my water sample. And then what's happening is the water will be pulled through the filter, but anything larger than 0.45 microns is going to stick to that filter and not pass through. So all of our coliform bacteria are larger than that 0.45 micron size, which means they're going to stick to the filter and not pass through it. So one bacterium is going to become two or three billion bacteria overnight. So when I place that filter on media, I'll be able to actually look at the bacteria that's growing without a microscope, and it'll be called what's called a colony on the plate, and I can see that without a microscope. So what I do for coliform bacteria is I place that filter on M. endomedia. It's selective for coliform bacteria, and coliform bacteria will look red and shiny on this media, and E. coli will look green and metallic. So if I see either coliform bacteria or E. coli in our distribution, what we do is we go back to the site, we'll retest the site, and then we'll take what's called an upstream and a downstream sample. If the upstream and downstream samples are negative, that indicates an issue at the site, so either contaminated faucet, another plumbing issue, a sampling error, something of that nature. If the upstream and downstream are positive, then that indicates there is an issue with our system. So what we would do at that point is we would notify DNR, which is our state regulatory agency, and issue a boil advisory. And something that could cause that would be like a main break or a backflow issue, something of that nature. In my time here, I've never seen a true positive distribution. It's always been a contaminated faucet or some kind of gross plumbing in the site where we uh, collected that sample from, which is really great. I also use that same method on the pools and spas that I mentioned that I test for every month. So I'll look for coliform bacteria in pools and spas. If a pool or spa is positive for coliform bacteria, I'll call the owner 
and they will stop chlorine to fool and bring another sample to make sure that they've killed off all the bacteria. In spas, I also look for another organism called Pseudomonas, and the reason why is because Pseudomonas likes warm aquatic environments, so a hot tub is a great place for Pseudomonas to thrive. If you or someone you know gets into a hot tub with Pseudomonas, it can cause UTIs, ear infections, respiratory infections, and something called hot tub syndrome. Hot tub syndrome is a necrotizing skin rash, so often when patients get that rash, they are hospitalized. It's very serious, and because of those health threats from Pseudomonas, that is why spas are required to test for that once a month. To look for Pseudomonas, I use that same membrane filtration method, but I place it on what's called Pseudomonas isolation auger. That auger allows Pseudomonas to express its green pigment, so the colonies will look green on my filter. So this was a very heavily colonized spa. If a spa is positive for Pseudomonas, what I will do is call the owner, and they will shut it down, <clears throat> drain it, disinfect it, and then bring me another sample, and the spa has to stay shut down until all successive samples are free of pseudomonas. So that's how serious of a health threat that that is. So now moving away from bacteria, I'm going to move into another group of microorganisms called protozoa. And this one specifically is Cryptosporidium. So this is actually what Cryptosporidium oocysts look like under the microscope. This became a major concern for us here in the water industry in the early 90s. It got through Milwaukee's water treatment plant. 400,000 people got sick and 100 pediatric leukemia patients passed away because they were immunocompromised. Cryptosporidium has what's called a protective, it has an oocyst, which is a protective capsule around it, which makes it hard to treat once it's in the body because medicine actually cannot penetrate that oocyst, so it's hard to have medicine get to the organism to kill it. Often it's called self-limiting, which means that the body just has to get rid of it itself, so you're sick for often weeks when you've got cryptosporidium. This is a problem for our immunocompromised demographic because obviously their immune system is compromised, so they have a lot of trouble fighting this organism off. For us in the water industry, the oocyst is a problem because it makes it resistant to chlorine, so that means that these early stages of treatment have to remove those oocysts for us because chlorine effectively does nothing. <laughs> Looking for cryptosporidium directly is very time consuming and it's not the most accurate method. So what I use is another indicator organism called bacillus. And the reason why is bacillus produces endospores that are very similar in resistance to cryptosporidium oocysts. So the EPA requires that we have a three log or 1,000 fold removal of those oocysts. So what that means is that if we have 10,000 to start, <coughs> after our treatment and disinfection we can only have 10 in our finished water. So here to my water works, I do endospore studies once a week. This was our raccoon river and there was a little over a million endospores per liter. Lots of colonies on there. <clears throat> and this is our finished water and there were only three endospores per liter. So we're definitely meeting that 1,000 fold removal and more. <clears throat> So here at Des Moines Waterworks, we're really blessed because we do have two source waters. Um, with Cryptosporidium, if we saw one, in, if we saw Cryptosporidium, one of our source waters, we probably switch rivers just to avoid the threat. Like I said, once it's coming through the plant, we're only relying on these early stages of treatment. And even though we're seeing that it is removing those endospores with the 1,000-fold removal, prevention is sort of best in the case of Cryptosporidium. Um, other places that do not have second sources sort of have to deal with it as it comes. So often they might have to implement UV or some other sort of treatment option like that. But thankfully, Iowa's water sources are pretty low in cryptosporidium. We keep our calving operations small and away from waterways, and we want to ensure that we're always doing that. Cryptosporidium is shed in the feces of young cattle. Um, when I looked at the Merck veterinary manual, it said when they're around two to three weeks of age, and often um, they said like 85% of young cattle are shedding cryptosporidium oocysts which is why we want to make sure we're keeping those away from our source waters so we're not contaminating the water that we will eventually drink. So moving into our last group of microorganisms, these pictures that you see here are phytoplankton. If you've ever like looked at a pond or a fountain or something and seen kind of like foamy green sludgy stuff, that's phytoplankton. So the green uh, algae in this group is a problem for us because in high numbers it can clog our filters if our filters get clogged, that means that other disease-causing organisms can break through and that impedes our entire treatment process. So if I'm seeing high numbers of green algae, what we'll do is we might backwash our filters more often just to make sure that we're keeping them nice and clean and they aren't getting clogged. But one of the biggest threats from this group comes from the blue-green algae or cyanobacteria. And the reason why is because cyanobacteria actually produces toxins. So here at Des Moines Waterworks, these are the four cyanotoxins that we monitor for. 
There have been major outbreaks of these toxins reported globally. Um, probably the most famous one is in 2014 in Toledo, Ohio. Microcystin actually got through to their finished water and they had to issue a do not drink order. But patients who had drank the water before the order was issued reported all kinds of symptoms. GI symptoms, neurological symptoms, skin disorders. They tested the liver enzymes of these patients, which indicated liver damage. These toxins affect major organs um, and major organ systems. So I'm talking your liver, your kidneys, your neurological system, which is why when they saw the liver damage, they figured it was microcystin. That's the one that likes to attack our livers. <clears throat> And cyanotoxins are not just limited to drinking and recreational water. You can also be exposed to them in other ways. Um, one such way is aquatic foods. So sometimes people like to drink that kombucha tea. Um, they use phytoplankton in the fermentation process, so it has been identified as a potential source of cyanotoxin exposure. Um, also certain medical procedures. So one example, in 1996 in Peru, Brazil, there were patients who were receiving hemodialysis treatment. That treatment is used for patients who are experiencing kidney damage or renal failure. Um, in that treatment, they use an osmotic gradient, which uses water. And what happened was they used water contaminated with microcystins, and they did not know. Every single patient who received that treatment passed away. And upon autopsy, they discovered high levels of microcystin in their serum and tissues. So it's very serious. We're not just worried about it for people who are drinking our water. We're also worried about the, med the organizations who are using our water for medical procedures um, and other medical devices, because these cyanotoxins would be a concern for them as well. So here in the micro lab, what I do is I do count. So I'll count the number of green algae and the number of cyanobacteria in our water samples. If I'm seeing high levels of cyanobacteria, I let chemistry know. And they have an instrument that can actually measure the level of cyanotoxins in a water sample. And then they have what's called um, threshold or reference values. And we can use those to determine if the cyanotoxins are at safe or unsafe levels for consumption. So then to finish off my tour, what I like to do and I'm going to project a slide up on that screen back there um, just to kind of give you an example of how active our water bodies can be microbiologically. The sample that I'm showing you was not our finished water. It's a sample taken out of a far pond, but um, you could probably assume it would be pretty similar to what our rivers would look like, but not the water that's coming out of our plants. Katie talked about the cyanotoxins and the event in Toledo. The the event in Toledo was kind of a national news type of thing. The EPA responded to that with a health advisory in 2015. Um, Des Moines Water Works has long been interested in cyanobacteria, kind of from a plant performance perspective. Uh, the toxins are something now that we've got the equipment and the, again, the expertise to, to do the analysis. We, we will see microcystin in our raw waters. So we may not be that different than Toledo, Ohio is, is kind of the message and it's a reminder that we need to be vigilant in regard to knowing what's going on in each of these rivers and making informed choices about their use. The circle around my monitor represents a pinhole, so we're magnifying 1,000 times right now. That guy right there that's moving around is called a paramecia, and he actually feeds off of bacteria. That's what he's doing right now as he vibrates these hair-like structures called cilia and sucks the bacteria in. These teeny, 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 tiny little coccyon rods, as they're called in the micro world that you see, are all bacteria. So you can see in this one little drop of sample uh, how much bacteria is there as well as these other protists that we're seeing. So there's other paramecia swimming around and eating. Scanning around and see what we can see. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. When you do your phyto counts, uh -huh. do you do it on a slide? I do, yes. Yeah. So I have um, what's called a well slide, and I use a glycerin preparation for that. Just um, the glycerin actually kills them and then freezes them in place, so it allows me to count them. Because if they were swimming around like this, I wouldn't be able to keep track or count them or anything like mm -hmm. that. Yep. Okay, so there's a really fast guy swimming around. If I can get him to stop, that is a employee.
So that guy is really fast as the employees. I can't even keep up with him. There you go. He also eats bacteria and other detritus, which is um, dead organisms and dead matter. So they help scavenge the environment and keep it nice and clean. 